I would think it's, it's interesting. It's been yeah. an interesting journey. Well, thanks, Dave, yep. for the uh, for the invitation to speak today. Thanks for the kind introduction. Thank you guys for coming out uh, in person. This is my first seminar in person since the pandemic, and I have to say it's really great to be face to face with actual people. Hopefully, we have some good interactions today. And so today. Um, I'm going to talk about a relatively new project in the laboratory. We mainly focused on potassium channel pharmacology for the last 15 years or so. Um, and, and now we're returning uh, to work on cell volume regulated anion channels encoded by the LERC 8 uh, gene family. I'm, and I'm basically going to steal some work from a previous graduate student, Eric Figueroa, who I understand is on Zoom from uh, San Francisco right now. Uh, but the bigger part, bigger point I want to make is I hope to convince you that this is a really good time to develop the pharmacology uh, for the LERC8 uh, gene family volume regulated anti channels uh, due to sort of the convergence of several uh, advances in the field over the last several years. So let's see if we can do this. There's no, I can't. That was fantastic. Thank you guys for coming. <laughs> the IT support here. Hang on. There we go. Great. All right. So in a nutshell, our broad mission is translating discoveries in not translating discoveries from basic science, basic science laboratories into novel therapies through early stage drug discovery and target validation. Um, our main focus, our only focus really is on ion channels. These are membrane spanning proteins that carry ions across the plasma membrane and in doing so carry electrical current, which is used by cells doing important work. And they're absolutely essential for life. So not surprisingly, they've been conserved from bacteria, nematodes, insects, to uh, humans. And you'd be hard pressed identifying a single biological process it doesn't rely in some form or fashion on the activity of ion channels. They're involved in fertilization, cell division, and program cell death, and almost everything in between. So from bone metabolism, uh, skeletal muscle function, neural function, balance, taste, pain, you name it, ion channels are involved. And not surprising, since they're involved in so many physiological processes, many of these are attractive drug targets. So I'm going to talk about chloride channels today, but I want to just bring your attention that, again, our major focus is on potassium channels. We have several programs developing small molecule modulators of different families of potassium channels. I wanted to drop this slide just so you know that this is what we also work on in case you want to ever talk about some of these projects. So we have an ongoing collaboration. I think we're in our sixth year with Ona Pharmaceuticals developing small molecule modulators of two four domain potassium channels for the treatment of various neurological disorders. Uh, we have a really interesting project funded by NICHD uh, where we're trying to develop um, new ways of, of debilitating sperm functions uh, by focusing on a sperm specific potassium channel slow three. So hopefully developing uh, novel contraceptives. We have several programs uh, focusing on inward rectifier potassium channels, one on cure 151 for novel uh, diuretics, cure 61 HR2B for treatment of patent ductus arteriosus. We have a fairly new project funded by Salino Pharmaceuticals where we're developing cure 62 HR1 uh, modulators for the treatment of hyperphagic obesity. So today we're going to talk about core um, channels. So Eric, I hope you can see this. When I asked Eric for a picture, this is the one that he sent. Uh, this was several years ago. He's probably looks much older now. Um, <laughs> but I have to say it's a flattering picture here. Um, we have actually taken it right outside in that forehead. So this is Eric. He did his PhD in pharmacology, graduated in 2020. He's now a postdoctoral fellow at Lily Chan's laboratory in UCSF. Um, and he was really the first to do sort of really early stage drug discovery for this volume-regulated anion channel that we're going to talk about today. 
this is what you get. And let's talk about chloride channels. So like all ion channels, chloride channels, which um, are plasma membrane proteins, they function to move chloride down their electrochemical gradient across the plasma membrane. There are lots of different families of potassium channels, many of which you've probably heard about. So you have the GABA receptor, uh, which is a GABA ligand-gated uh, chloride channel that plays important roles in inhibitory um, transmission in the, in the brain. You have calcium-activated chloride channel, cyclic nucleotide-gated channels like cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, which is a cyclic AMP-gated channel that plays an important role in lung function. Uh, we have voltage-gated chloride channels, volume-activated chloride channels, which we're going to talk about today, as well as proton-activated chloride channels, which Eric did a little bit of work on while he was here. Uh, so a little bit uh, more detail about some of these, these chloride channels. Uh, they play critically important roles, and consequently, in some cases, uh, they're useful drug targets. So I mentioned CFTR, which is the Cystic Fibrosis Transmembrane Conductance Regulator. This is cyclic AMP. Regulated ion channel, ion channel uh, expressing epithelial cells of the lung and the pancreas plays really important roles in chloride secretion, hydration of the lungs, for example. Loss of function mutations cause cystic fibrosis because those lungs, lung epithelial cells, no longer secrete chloride and water, so they become dry uh, and cause the phenotypes associated with the lung phenotypes associated with CI. Um, the last several years, CFTR has really been a success story for developing new drugs to correct the activity of, of ion channels. So Vertex Pharmaceuticals um, has been instrumental in developing correctors and potentiators of CFTR uh, channels that are defective in CF patients. And consequently, we've seen the development uh, and FDA approval of drugs that actually are effective at treating the lung phenotype of uh, CF patients, you know, doing so expanding the lifespan of those patients. Um, we won't talk too much about GABA receptors. You know, they're critically important as benzodiazepine and barbiturate targets in treatment of epilepsy. Uh, calcium activated chloride channels and go to buy TMEM 16A. I believe Eric in Jan's lab is working on TMEM 16 something. So he's sort of continuing his work on chloride channels. Um, Crofelomer is actually an FDA approved natural drug that's useful in treating diarrhea. Then we also have these other full uh, chloride channel families, voltage-gated CLC channels, CLC-KB, um, and VRAC, the volume-regulated anion channel, which we're going to talk about um, today. So just like ion channels are critically important for life, the ability of a cell to regulate its own volume in response to an osmotic stress is also essential for life. It's a phylogenetically evolutionarily ancient process that arose early during evolution and allowed us to actually escape the primordial ocean and move on to land, okay? So consider a situation where we have a cell that's suddenly exposed to a high osmotic challenge. This causes the osmotic influx of water into the cell, causing the cell to expand its volume. Now, if this process were to continue, eventually the cell membrane would, would lice and rupture, it would spill its genetic material into the surroundings and that cell would no longer be competent for living, but also importantly surviving uh, eventually as a complex tissue organism um, and organism. So this is where the volume regulated anion channel comes in. This is a plasma membrane channel that actually senses a mechanical stretch on the membrane. So during cell swelling, this channel opens and allows for chloride and oddly enough, this is a weird, weird ion channel. It allows organic osmolites like taurine um, to leave the cell, which reverses the osmotic driving force and allowing the cell to undergo a process called regulatory volume decrease and return to its normal volume, okay? So <clears throat> that's where it comes in. This is what the function of the channel looks like in an electrophysiology experiment. So we're patch clamping in the whole cell mode, a cell which endogenously expresses VRAC, and uh, we're recording current at minus at plus 100 millivolts and minus 100 millivolts. And after establishing a, a stable baseline, we expose the cell to a hyposmotic stress, which causes cell swelling. And you can see that we see activation of this channel over time. Right. Um, interestingly enough, we can actually reverse that, that process by exposing it to a hypertonic solution causing cell shrinkage. So we get activation, and we rapidly turn this off with cell shrinkage. So these channels are cell volume sensors. 
These channels also play an important role in sensing intracellular ionic strength. So they're activated not only by cell swelling, but also a reduction in intracellular ionic strength. And although the mechanisms appear to be independent, there is a crosstalk between them. So this is sort of a cartoon diagram that we, we, we published recently in JGP. Um, showing the punitive mechanisms and interaction of uh, these, these uh, mechanisms for, for activation of the channel. So if you patch clamp onto a cell with normal ionic strength in your, in your pipette, when you apply a hypotonic solution causing cell swelling, some sort of mechanical force is applied to this channel um, where initially you don't see activation, but with additional swelling, you get channel opening and um, channel activation. Now, if you lower the intracellular ionic strength, you can get activation with swelling, but it takes less cell swelling. So lowering intracellular ionic strength actually lowers the volume set for the channel. So you get activation and lower cell volumes. And if you really lower ionic strength at very low levels, you can get activation in the channel completely independently of cell volume regulation. Now, the molecular mechanisms underlying these processes are are still unclear, but with the uh, recent development of cryo structures, we're beginning to understand more about the mechanisms. So <clears throat> the gene family was, or actually the ion channels were identified in patch clamp experiments more than 30 years ago by two independent groups. In 1988, um, these groups went in and patch clamped various cells, swelled those cells and saw this volume regulated anion channel activity. And between then and 2014, several gene candidates were put forth as, as encoding the volume regulated anion, cha anion channel. P glycoprotein, CLC2, which is one of those voltage gated chloride channels, protein called PICLN uh, was proposed as a candidate for it. Eventually, CLC3 was proposed. None of those really turned out to, you know, uh, to be the genes that encode VRAC. They turned out to be regulators of the channel. There was a lot of confusion in the field for close to 30 years. And a lot of people just finally just gave up on it. Said, we're done with this. Too much confusion. Moving on. <clears throat> However, in 2014, two laboratories, Artem Patapudian's group and Thomas Yench's group, both performed genome-wide siRNA screens where they individually knocked down genes and used a fluorescence assay, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, to look for genes that when knocked down, reduce the activity of VRAC. And they both landed on the same genes and these were published within a month or two of each other. Um, <clears throat> those genes, uh, the D gene, which reduced VRAC activity was leucine rich repeat containing 8A. LERC 8A was identified as an essential gene for the volume regulated anion channel. LERC 8A is also called Swell 1. This was the name that came out of Artem Patapudian's group. The reason I think it's a swell time <clears throat> to develop pharmacology. Um, in the LERC 8 family, there's not only A, but there's also B, C, D, and E. Okay. Based on crystal structures that have been published, uh, we think these are heterohexameric channels. So uh, based on a number of studies now, we know that you have to express LERC 8A plus one other family member. So lurk 8 a with C, D, or E. B is a bit of an enigma right now. We don't understand it. <clears throat> but we do know that 8A with B, C, D, or E forms volume-regulated anion channel activity with different sort of biophysical properties. Uh, these things, when heterologously expressed, look like volume-regulated anion channels. They have the appropriate anion selectivity sequence they also uh, conduct these weird organic anions like glycine, taurine, like you know, so forth and so on. Uh, the reason I put this up there, I should say, Karen put this up there, was to show that these channels are permeable to the anion iodine, right? So file that away, I'll be coming back to that. And as I mentioned, uh, within, within a couple of years, a few years, I think four different groups published cryo-M structures of LERC 8A just the homo hexamer. And they all show the same thing basically, is that these are hexameric uh, channel assemblies. Here's the channel from the side. Here's the top down view where you can see the subunit surrounding the central pore that conducts chloride and these other anions, all right? All right, so it turned out that 
we found out that if you just delete work 8A, you can abolish channel activity because it's the essential subunit, right? Delete work 8A, there's no channel activity, whether or not B, C, D, or E are expressed at all. So this has been used, put to good use, I should say, by lots of different groups where they can knock out lurk 8A either in an entire mouse or in you know, specific tissues and explore the role of ERAC in various physiological processes in a way that hadn't been done previously using sort of dirty pharmacology. Um, and we've learned a lot about the channel over the last several years. So it plays an important role in the uptake of, of cancer drugs, uh, particularly lurk 8D channels appear to be important for um, taking up chemotherapeutic agents and a reduction in certain types of cancers. Uh, the expression of LERC-D is associated with the resistance of those tumors uh, to these chemotherapeutic agents. Uh, explore, explore, it plays an important role in neural signaling and stroke. It just emphasizes signaling and growth, innate immunity, pancreatic signaling, and sperm development. So lots of sort of unanticipated new physiological roles are coming out with the cloning of the gene family. This is just an example of its role in, in certain neurons in the brain. Uh, so, and it's, and it's potential um, therapeutic, therapeutic potential as a, uh, a drug target for ischemic stroke. So during ischemia, we have a reduction in oxygen, reduction in ATP. This inhibits the sodium potassium ATPase, which causes cell swelling, which we know now activates the volume regulated anion channel. And because it's one of these weird channels that conducts lots of, lots of, weird solutes, um, it dumps glutamate out into the extracellular space. This causes excitotoxicity and cell death associated with ischemic stroke. So it's a possibility that an inhibitor of BREC might be useful in uh, treating um, stroke, <clears throat> ischemic stroke specifically. Uh, this is sort of a novel role of the channel in beta cell signaling. So beta cells are, are found in the pancreas. They secrete insulin. Um, this is sort of the, the classic model where following a mill, you have an increase in glucose, which in beta cells increases the ratio of ATP to ADP. Um, this inhibits the so-called KATP gated channels, which causes membrane depolarization, opening of L-type calcium channels, influx of calcium, and the excitosis of insulin-containing granules. And that insulin released to the periphery returns blood glucose to preprandial levels. Uh, so this is the, the glucose insulin cycle. Um, well, one investigator, Rajan Sa, uh, he actually used this lurk 8 a knockout mouse to show that in response to uh, elevation in, in intracellular glucose, which causes cell swelling, you actually activate the volume regulated anion channel because it conducts chloride outwardly it, it potentiates the depolarization of this, this glucose-mediated pathway here, causes further depolarization, and potentiates insulin secretion uh, in beta cells. And so it's, it's a possibility that an activator of VREC might be therapeutically useful for promoting insulin secretion in type 2 diabetic patients. <clears throat> but the problem, as is much of the, the time uh, you know, when I approach a target, is that the pharmacology for VREC is just awful. Right. So you're relying on really weak, non-specific inhibitors that have really been around for decades. They hit not only VRAC, but every other, other, every other type of chloride channel. Um, there are currently no direct activators of VRAC. The best in class is a compound called DCPIB. It's about a two to five micromolar inhibitor, which isn't terrible, but it's you know, not where we want it to be. The problems have lots of off-target effects. Uh, it inhibits glutamate transporters, cure channels, uh, pumps, and more recently, we showed that it actually is a, a direct inhibitor of mitochondrial respiration, which affects basically every cell in your body. So DCP IV is not great. There's another one that's been used recently called, called carbonoxalone, IC50 of 15 micromolar. The problem is that its primary target is gap junction uh, or hemi channels. And then again, I mentioned weak and nonspecific chloride channel inhibitors, such as SIDS, DIDS, and I gases. These came out of the early 80s and really haven't been improved upon. So one of the goal, goals of, of Eric's thesis work was to discover and develop more potent and selective modulators of BREX so we could start to explore the therapeutic potential of the channel in various disease models. And so I think probably everyone here at Vanderbilt knows that we have really state-of-the-art world-class 
infrastructure for doing uh, sort of early stage drug discovery. So we have a high throughput screening center. We have 110,000 small molecule discovery collection, which you can screen for modulators of your target of interest, extensive instrumentation for automated screening. Uh, we also have a 384 well patch clamp electrophysiology rig uh, that's, that's used by some investigators here. We also have a chemical synthesis core in the Warren Center for Neuroscience Drug Discovery uh, that can do medicinal chemistry, compound synthesis, purification, as well as drug metabolism and pharmacokinetic profiling. So when you're dealing with ion channel pharmacology, the gold standard method is patch clamp electrophysiology, right? So um, a typical patch clamp rig is shown here, uh, it takes up a small room. You've got this gigantic Faraday cage, a microscope, you've got a flotation table to prevent uh, vibration. And the basic premise is that you have some cells sitting at the bottom of the dish surrounded by physiological buffer. Uh, you press this, this uh, smooth tipped patch clamp glass pipette up against the cell. You make a high resistance seal, you apply more section and create a, a continuity between the solution that's in the pipette and the inside of the cell. You have uh, this electrode that's hooked up to a voltage clamp amplifier, which allows you to control the voltage of the cell membrane potential and then doing so evaluate the activity of the ion channel. Uh, that's expressed there. Here's a typical, a typical step protocol that's used uh, where you hold at some voltage and you step progressively to more polarized potentials uh, before returning to a negative potential. And this is the volume regulated anion channel current. This is what it looks like. So in response to this step protocol, you have this sort of outwardly rectifying, meaning that it expresses more current <laughs> upwardly than downwardly. And you have this time dependent inactivation of these large positive potentials. So that's a classic signature for the volume regulated anion channel. <clears throat> the problem with this technique is that it's incredibly slow and labor intensive. It requires a lot of expertise. Not, not everyone loves to do patch clamp electrophysiology. It requires a lot of patience and skill, especially when you're working on the volume rate on VRAC, because uh, not only are you, you know, disrupting the integrity of the cell with this, this glass pipette and big solution attached to it, you're physically stressing the cell and swelling it. And oftentimes the cell will just pop off the end of the pipette. So there's a high failure rate. Doing experiments on VREC is even more challenging than normal ion channel electrophysiology. But Toshiki Yamada over there is the master at it in the laboratory. And he does experiments that would make most people cry. <laughs> and for drug discovery, the bigger problem is that you can only test one compound at a time, one cell at a time. Right? And so if you want to screen 110,000 compounds, you're talking about years of work right? at this rate. So we went with our standard fluorescence-based high throughput screening approach. This is a brute force approach where you screen thousands of compounds for some activity against, in this case, VRAC. This is fluorescence-based using multi-well plates. We use a 384 well plate. And this allows you to perform hundreds of experiments simultaneously and thousands of experiments daily. So this is the assay that we use. This is the fluorescence YFP quenching assay that we use to monitor the activity of VRAC. And consequently, this is the same assay that both groups used for the genome-wide screening um, where they identified lurk 8 a as the essential subunit for VRAC. So the basic premise is this, we take a hex cell, right? VRACs are ubiquitously expressed in mammalian cells, right? So you can take almost any cell line. VRAC will be expressed there. Um, we engineered a stable cell line that expresses a, a variant of YP, YFP. It's brighter, it's more pH resistant, its fluorescence is more stable. Um, and we express it in these hex cells. And we plate these hex cells in a 384 plate. And we measure the fluorescence uh, change in response to iodide. So remember when I was talking about the selectivity sequence, the ion selectivity sequence for VRAC, it conducts iodide down its electrochemical gradient. So we'll take this cell, we'll activate the channel with swelling, we'll add iodide, it moves through the channel and it uh, quenches the YFP fluorescence. This is what the data looks like. So here we're looking at normalized fluorescence on the y-axis as a function of time. So we swell the cell with a hypotonic solution for about five minutes. So you see this change in fluorescence. And at B, we add iodide. You can see there's this rapid quenching of fluorescence over time, right? And we know that this is dependent upon VRAC because if we do the same experiment 
in a hex cell that's missing the essential LERC 8A subunit, we see a significant blunting of quenching, right? So see the difference between the red and B. So that means that the signal window is largely due to iodide dependent quenching uh, carried by BRAC. Uh, importantly, Eric established early on that we could use it for pharmacology. So he used carbonoxalone, that's a 15 micromolar inhibitor that I talked about um, a minute ago. He ran the same experiment. So here's um, in the blue up here, here's our control. And he added 50 micromolar carbonoxalone and you saw the significant blunting here. Importantly, it can report the dose-dependent modulation of the channel with an IC50 of 18 micromolar, which is very close to the 15 micromolar IC50 that's been published. Uh, he went on to check a series of sort of benchmarks that we evaluate in determining whether or not an assay is suitable for high throughput screening. So he did a so-called uh, checkerboard analysis where every other well receives, receives either um, hypotonic saline or hypotonic saline with carbonoxalone uh, across the entire plate and you evaluate the quenching um, effect of iodide across the entire plate. And you can see here on the scatter plot, here's fluorescent quenching on the y-axis, it's a function of the well number. You get a nice separation of these two populations of channels where Here's your quenching uh, in our control buffer, but if you block the channel, you get less quenching, right? Calculate the Z prime of 0.7, which is a statistical measure of uniformity across the plate. We get a, a value that tells us that it's suitable for HTS. You also evaluate the effects of DMSO. After all, we're gonna be looking at compounds dissolved in DMSO, and you can see that uh, across the important doses of DMSO, um, DMSO has no direct effect on quenching. So Eric, this is for you, if, you can, if you're still listening. Um, Eric always insisted on showing this cartoon diagram of a guy throwing a plate of spaghetti on the wall because he likened high throughput screening to throwing spaghetti against the wall and looking for what stuck, right? So that's for you, Eric, I kept it in there. Um, so he screened an FDA library. So this is a library of about 1200 compounds of drugs that have been approved uh, for use by the FDA. And when he screened these compounds, the first compound that came out was a drug called Pranlicast, right? This is the chemical structure here. Um, and this is just how it behaved in the, the pharmacology uh, assay. So looking at normalized fluorescence, function of time, hypo, 100 micromolar Pranlicast led to a significant blunting of that. Uh, here's a dose uh, response curve showing an IC50 of about 8 micromolar. This is not actually a true IC50 value because you'll note we only see about 50% efficacy at most, right? So it's a partial antagonist of this channel. Uh, so what, are, what is pranlicast? Well, it's an inhibitor, the cytonyl leukotriene triene, triene receptor 1 antagonist. Um, so these are these receptors are prominently expressed in airway epithelial cells. They're GQ coupled GPCRs that lead to calcium release. Um, agonists of the channel released endogenously. These are leukotrienes. Um, they cause brain bronchoconstriction and asthma, underlying asthma. And so an antagonist of this receptor can actually be used for treatment of asthma. Um, an important point I want to bring out is pranlicast. It's a very potent antagonist of this receptor. So it's single nanomolar affinity, like less than 10 nanomolars, like five nanomolars, or something like that. So I want you to, to bring that out in comparison to the, the IC50 of eight micromolar that we're, that we're seeing for inhibition of VRAC. So that's a primer for what's to come. So this was really an interesting discovery because, because leukotriene receptor signaling had been implicated in regulation of VRAC before. So this paper published by Ian Lambert's lab in 2013 showed using really high concentrations of these, these receptor antagonists, so ferlic acid in this case, file that away, we'll come back to it. 60 micromolars of ferlic acid was able to inhibit swelling-induced osmolite release in these cells, right? So if you swell these cells, channels release weird things, we measured those weird things. 60 micromolars of ferlic acid inhibited that release. Um, and so they concluded, based on some other pharmacology, that leukotrienes potentiate VRAC and that is involved in regulation of, uh, of the channel. 
Okay, so Eric stood back and said, well, I need to figure out whether these are direct modulators of the channel or we've just found another modulator of leukotriene receptor signaling that's, that's modulating the channel indirectly through the receptor. So he asked, does pranolin cast inhibit VRAC activity directly or indirectly via the channel? And so he, he went to patch clamp electrophysiology, right? So first of all, just to confirm that it wasn't a, an artifact of the fluorescence assay. And he did some experiments. And so here's a stent protocol. Here's the swelling induced chloride current um, without and then with three micromolar pranoclasts. And you can see that there is a reduction in current amplitude. And this is the concentration response curve from patch clamp experiments. Again, we see only about 50% efficacy. Right. And so take that IC50 value of 212 nanomolar with a grain of salt. But the electrophysiology supported what we saw in the pharmacopic or in the fluorescence assay. Uh, this is just another way of looking at it using a RAM protocol. And using both, we see um, three micromolar pranolicast inhibits the current. We looked at the voltage dependence. So the percent inhibition as a function of voltage at minus 100 and plus 100. Doing this sort of analysis, uh, especially for poor blockers, can sometimes lead to an early understanding of the mechanism of action, but he saw uh, no significant differences between the voltages. So it's a voltage independent inhibitor. Uh, Pranolin cast action is rapid and reversible, right? So for an ion channel modulator, you want something that's gonna act fairly, uh, fairly quickly, uh, take hours to develop. Um, and ideally it would be reversible, showing that it, the ligand hits the binding site and actually can be reversed. And that's exactly what he saw. So here, here's uh, before and then during and after hypotonic cell swelling, reaches a steady state, adds pranolicast, you get this rapid inhibition with a time constant of about a minute, and this is rapidly reversible. Okay, so it's looking like an ion channel, a direct ion channel modulator. He also noticed that in the presence of pranolicast, the kinetics of inactivation that you get at those large positive potentials, um, something happens to them. You introduce a second faster time constant, which is shown here. So taking together all of these properties, uh, Pranolicast is acting like a direct channel modulator, right? Well, let's look at the receptor. So Pranolicast was discovered in the assay in hex cells, right? Um, hex cells are known to uh, you know, have GQ coupled receptors. Is it possible that the leukotriene receptor, CIS-LT1 is expressed there? Uh, so he began to look at it from that perspective. Uh, he's going to look at this using the calcium indicator dye flow eight. So one of the first things we did is we went to the, the uh, human protein atlas, which is an online resource where they've looked at lots of the, you know, the expression of various mRNAs and various cell types and tissues. Um, and fortunately, they, they listed uh, HEC293 cells. And so this is uh, expression of cis Cis LT1 receptor. You can see there's absolutely no signal for it. Cis LT1 receptor, according to HPH, HPA database, not expressed. Interestingly, A549 cells, which is the cell line that Ian Lambert used in his earlier paper, receptor also not expressed there. But it is expressed in THB1 cells, which Eric went on to use as a positive control. He reproduced these results. He found absolutely no measurable expression of the receptor in hex cells, but he got a nice robust signal in THP1 cells. So at the mRNA level, at least cis uh, LT1R is not expressed. What about the functional level, right? So he took advantage of the fact uh, that hex cells endogen endogenously express the M3 muscarinic receptor, and they can be activated with acetylcholine. So he took HEH293 cells, loaded them with flow 8, and did a dose response curve with acetylcholine. And so he was able to see a nice dose dependent increase in intracellular calcium as a function of ACH calculation or ACH dose. And that concentration response curve is shown here. So that tells us that GQ coupled receptors are expressed and GQ signaling is intact. Well, what about an agonist of the cyst nil leukotriene receptor one? So we use the most potent agonist of this receptor, leukotriene uh, D4, uh, which is an endogenously, endogenously expressed leukotriene um, that activates cis-LT1 receptors. And when he looked at across various doses of LTD4, using the flow 8 assay, he saw absolutely no change in calcium concentration, right? Totally flat. However, if he 
heterologously express the receptor, he was able to reconstitute this nice dose-dependent increase in calcium, right? So nice, nice believable EC50 for LTV4, right? So what that tells us is that receptor is not expressed, but GQ couple uh, signaling is. So he concluded that the cisnel leukotriene receptor, um, well, sorry, back up. He then went on to take the cells overexpressing the receptor and asked, well, if I overexpress receptor, does that change the sensitivity of VRAC to uh, Cranley gas? And uh, he showed that there was no effect. So here are hex cells expressing GFP as a control or HEC293 cells expressing uh, the receptor. And there's no change in the sensitivity of VRAC to Cranley gas. So he went and asked, oh, well, is this a general property of, of these uh, receptor antagonists? So he looked at zephyrlic acid. And you'll recall this, zephyrlic acid was the uh, receptor antagonist that the Ian Lambert laboratory used. 60 micromolar zephyrlic acid inhibited um, swelling-induced taurine release in this case. So he looked at the percent inhibition of VRAC, and he saw a nice dose-dependent inhibition of the channel with an EC50 of 17 micromolar. But in this case, we got almost complete efficacy, right? So Pranocas, uh, partial antagonist, the Perlic gas, um, almost a complete antagonist of the channel. So this was his conclusion. Pranocas and the Perlic gas inhibit VREC independently of the cis-LT1 receptor, right? So, um, you know, how do you go to the next step? So oftentimes you want to ask, well, is this a direct channel modulator? And in ion channel pharmacology, a couple of ways that you can go about this is either site-directed mutagenesis, where you go in, you engineer mutations into a, a suspected binding site, and you see how that mutation affects the pharmacology of the channel in patch clamp experiments, right? All right. Another is a structural biology approach, so determine a crystal structure, a cryoim structure um, in complex with the inhibitor, something like that. Well. The site-directed mutagenesis approach is a bit complicated for VRAC because as I mentioned, these are heteromultimeric complexes, right? And we don't really even know the ratio of 8A to other subunits. And the subunits expressed with the channel might, different, might be different between cell types. They might even be different um, in the same cell type. So you probably have an ensemble of molecularly distinct channels with different arrangements of subunits. So how do you go about that? I mean, you can imagine if I were to introduce a mutation into 8A, the effect of that mutation will likely depend on what that subunit is next to. It could be another 8A, it could be an 8A and an 8 something else, and that something else could be B, C, D, or E, right? So it's very complicated. So one approach would be to simplify the system and go with a homomeric channel, right? Where mutation will have the same you know, structural changes across the entire channel. So perhaps the LERC 8AC homomeric channel. After all, we've got really nice high resolution cryo -M structures that we could use to guide and interpret effects of mutations on the pharmacology, right? The ideal. The problem is up until recently, and I think yeah, we published this this year, um, Toshiki, for the first time studied the functional properties of LERC 8A homohexameric channel. So no other studies, despite the existence of several cryo -M structures, had actually asked whether LERC 8A homohexameric channels function as volume regulated anion channels, and they don't. And the trick is, so if you just express LERC 8A by itself, you don't get channel activity, right? That's the problem. People tried, it didn't work, they just published the structure. Toshiki figured out a way to actually activate LERC 8A. And it's a combination of really low intracellular ionic strength and cell swelling. So getting back to those mechanisms that we talked about earlier. And when you do that, when you study or when you, when you activate LERC 8A, you see that it looks nothing like native volume regulated anion channels, right? So although it is a homomer, it's not activated by cell swelling. It's weakly activated by intracellular ionic strength. That's really the combination that gives you uh, the activity. And importantly for pharmacology, uh, it is very weakly inhibited by DCPIV. So instead of a two to five micromolar complete inhibitor, it's like 10 plus micromolar, 50% efficacy. It's a really poor inhibitor. 
And also he's shown recently that it's a really uh, poor target for zephyrlic acid, right? So the lurk 8 a homohexameric channel is not a good model for doing structured guided mutagenesis experiments. However, before coming to the lab from Kevin Strange's lab, uh, he developed a series of chimeras where he took parts of 8A and C, D, or D and swapped them out, looking for sort of the minimal channel structures required to give rise to a volume regulated anion channel, right? Uh, it was published in JGP if you guys want to go look at that. And what he found was that if you take LERC, LERC 8C, shown here in blue, almost all of it, spliced in 25 amino acids from the intracellular loop of LERC 8A shown here, you got normal volume regulated anion channels. And importantly, so it's activated by swelling, activated by low ionic strength, it's strongly inhibited by DCPIB, and it's also strongly inhibited by zephyrlic acid, right? So we think this might be a good model for understanding sort of the mechanism of action for um, not only sort of pharmacological um, agents, but also understanding mechanisms for cell volume regulation of this channel. And through an incredible collaboration with Eric and Karakis, over the last, I guess, nine months or so, um, his lab has been able to develop a, a fairly high resolution um, uh, cryo M structure of this LERC 8A, LERC 8C, 8A, IL-25 um, chimera. And um, I'm not gonna go into any details, but we're already learning 